day in the neighborhood reaction being yo 471 day in the neighborhood my brothers and sisters it is that time to get into another one of these true crime horror dark deep and mysterious what the is going on type of videos and today we're going back to the man the man that i like to call the lazy man none other than Lazy Masquerade Back to Lazy Masquerade y'all Hope y'all doing excellent day out there today And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again so Fuck with the bean And the title of the video is She ran for 23 years But AI cameras finally caught China's devil woman and that's a freaking mouthful right there, y'all. But the main thing I'm wondering is, like, how did these AI cameras, like, really play a part in this story? You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking more than likely that these AI cameras maybe made the footage more clear. You know what I'm saying? Where they got a clear picture of the woman face after freaking 23 years. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, y'all. I don't freaking know. But I think this is going to be a very good one. And I'm just ready to get into it. But. Before we get into it, my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to the lazy masquerade. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's and go. The lazy. Today we're exploring a region lock case that's easily one of the darkest I've ever come across. A story that involves a twisted romance, secret identities, a live TV standoff, and new AI cameras that just might end up solving thousands of other gold cases in the near future. Mm. This is the tale of Ba Si Ying and Lao Rongqi, China's very own Bonnie and Clyde. Mm. Have you ever faced a choice so clear, it felt like the universe was giving you a nudge? Like when you spot that dish you've been craving on a menu, or when your favourite artist announces a gig right in your hometown. In the world of business, we're always on the hunt for those no-brainer decisions. The ones that save us time, money, and stress. And that's where today's sponsor, Stamps.com, comes in. Hey, lazy snooky commercial in uh, on me, y'all. God damn it, hold up. Drop my damn lighter. But uh, I want to say this real quick, man. I hope, because a lot of people, and I'm one of them, who feel like AI is going to kind of like F up the world in a sense, you know what I'm saying? I don't think AI is so good for the world, but at the same time, there is a lot of good that AI can do too. Like our uh, lazy man was saying, man, AI could potentially help solve a lot of cold court uh, court cases. I'm still thinking about Mr. Baller from yesterday, but could I meant to say cold cases? AI could solve a lot of cold cases, man. Seriously, I'm talking about going back 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years ago type of cases. So, as much as AI, you can look at it as a bad thing, you can look at it on the bright side too. But let's get into it. Slash Lazy Masquerade. Born into an impoverished Chinese household in 1964. Fa Zi Ying had what can only be described as a rough start in life. He was the youngest of seven siblings, 
and with his father being a lowly cart driver and his mother a humble tea saleswoman, the family had to live hand to mouth, barely making enough to scrape by. And thankfully, all of the children were industrious, and each of them went on to get steady government jobs in Jujiang City. All of them, that is, except for Zi Ying. Mm. By the mid-1970s, he was the only one still at school, and his grades were poor to say the least. He had little interest in academics, and spent far more time slacking off than studying. An unambitious underachiever, Zi Ying was content to work alongside one of his parents and inherit their trade. But fate had other ideas. It was in 1977, when Zi Ying was just 14 years old, that his father drowned in the Yangtze River after getting caught in a whirlpool. Damn. Just a few months later, his mother was paralyzed in a car crash. Damn. The That's some terrible look, man. One of your parents died then. A couple of months later, one of your parents get in a car crash and get paralyzed. Like, dude, that is terrible. That's terrible. Boy had always lacked discipline and guidance, but with his siblings having now moved out, his father gone, and his mother no longer able to move, Si Ying was left to essentially raise himself. Unfortunately, he soon gave up on education and fell into a life of criminality. In 1981, Si Ying was sentenced to eight years of labor re education for robbery, assault, and hooliganism, but was released after serving just three years. In 1985, he found himself behind bars for a second time, this time on a 10-year sentence for robbery and intentional injury. But he was, again, released early in 1989. Okay, that's two strikes. He done went in there two times for doing crazy criminal-ish. So hey man, three strikes you out, but I hope the third strike don't end up being some murderer-ish. You know what I'm saying? I hope this time, it, it, cause then you gotta look back and be like, man, maybe we should have locked them up for longer, or just locked them up and threw away the key back then in the first two strikes. Let's go. After this second stint in prison, Si Ying tried to turn his life around. He became an entrepreneur and married a woman named Miao in 1990. The pair had a daughter the following year. Yet, despite his attempts to lead a normal life, Si Ying was still widely regarded as a gangster within the Jiujiang community. He adopted the nickname Beru Seven and was known to be connected with the local triad syndicate. It soon became obvious that an ordinary family life wasn't on the cards for Si Ying and less than two years after getting married, he and Miao separated. As part of their agreement, he paid her 85,000 yuan and moved out of their shared home. But as one door closes, another opens. And while attending a friend's wedding in 1993, 28-year-old Si Ying met and fell in love with his true soulmate, an 18-year-old elementary school teacher named Lao Rongji. Unlike Si Ying, Rongji had grown up in a relatively well-off household. On paper, the two were complete opposites. Where Zi Ying was lazy, unacademic, and rough around the edges, Rongji was enterprising, highly intelligent, and ladylike. Before they met, Zi Ying had already heard about Rongji. Her delicate features and sunny disposition had made her the talk of the town, and there were plenty of men hoping to catch her eye. Likewise, Rongji had not only heard about Zi Ying, but had become strangely fascinated with his bad boy reputation. She this is one of the old classic cases, y'all. And we just, I'm, just, I'm not going to call him Run G and whatever the dude name, I'm calling him Bunny and Clyde. So, this is one of the old classic cases of Bunny falling in love with the bad boy. You know what I'm saying? Because she came from a good home. She was a freaking teacher. Like, it's a lot of other men out there that she could have got with that would have loved to have been with her. But no, she want the bad guy. She won't cry. She viewed Si Ying as Zhu Jiang's very own Robin Hood, an outlaw who stole from the rich and gave to the needy, who kept a little something but wasn't greedy, a man who walked on the wild side. That appealed to Rongqi. Though her friends and family believed her to be a sensible, kind-hearted, and innocent young woman, secretly she found the monotony of everyday life rather mundane. Though she was still young and had landed herself a decent job, Rongji felt trapped in her life. She had wanted to go to college and achieve great things, but had been dissuaded from doing so by her brother. And now, it felt like every day was just the same thing over and over. It was a fine life, a decent life, 
a normal life, but in her mind, a boring life. Rongji had long been looking for a little excitement, and figuring that she had found that with Si Ying, she decided to leave the reception with the self-proclaimed troublemaker on his motorbike. It wasn't long before Zi Ying and Rong Ji began a relationship, and for them, romance didn't come cheap. They spent tens of thousands of yuan a month on dates, dates which Zi Ying paid for using triad money. Mm. He had officially fallen back into his old criminal ways, something which Rong Ji not only put up with, but actively encouraged. The ultimate example of a good girl gone bad, Rong Ji ended up leaving her job at the elementary school and chose to help her new boyfriend rob innocent townspeople to pay for their lavish lifestyle. Her life certainly wasn't boring anymore, that was for sure. On a swelteringly hot- Like, I understand, man, because we all go through this, where you feel like your life be boring and you just want to add a little more excitement, or you might feel like your partner is kind of boring, like you want a more exciting life with your, your partner, you know what I'm saying? But excitement don't mean that you gotta go out and do fucked up shit. It don't mean you got to go out robbing and, you know what I'm saying, committing crimes and stuff to be excited. Now, if that's the only thing that can get you excited is doing evil stuff, then you need to reevaluate what really life is and what's wrong and right. You know what I'm saying? You need to reevaluate who you are as a person if that's the only thing that can excite you. And you probably need to go get some damn help. You need to go to some counseling or something, man. Like, you can find excitement within any person or anybody without it being violent violent you know what i'm saying so that's the just the crazy part to me but she love it she love bunny love being with clyde doing this craziness summer's evening in 1996 si ying got into a dispute with members of a rival syndicate during which he ended up harpooning one of them knowing that there would soon be a bounty out on his head si ying ran to rong Ji's home and confided in her what had just happened rong Ji's family overheard their discussion and were shocked that their most beloved and promising daughter was in a relationship with such a scumbag. And they were even more shocked when she turned her back on them and fled the city with Si Ying to start a new life elsewhere. A life less Maid Marian and Robin Hood, and more Bonnie and Clyde. Indeed, psychologists believe that Rong Ji had developed hybristophilia, otherwise known as Bonnie and Clyde syndrome, a form mm. of paraphilia where an individual is aroused by criminal behavior. So just remember when you hear what she did next, that Rong Ji didn't choose a life of villainy because she was weak, or gullible, or even because she was blindly in love with Si Ying. She did so because it turned her on. Crazy. Now cut off from the triads, the couple found themselves in dire straits and desperate for cash. And so together, they devised a get-rich-quick scheme Rongji began working as a hostess in various seedy night spots, using the alias, Jin, and played the part of a married woman looking to have an affair. She would invite male clients back to her apartment for a night of fun, and, enchanted by her beauty, most of the monks accepted. Si Ying would then lock the door behind the client and play the role of Rongji's outraged husband. The client was then faced with a simple choice. Pay Si Ying some hush money for trying to bed his wife or face having his immoral activities exposed, something which could cost him his job, his reputation, and his marriage. Almost all of them agreed to pay. For months. They blackmailing the shit out of them dudes, man. Hey, D, Bunny and Clyde, like, kind of clever with it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying, man, the whole setup, the way they doing it, Bunny and Clyde, like, they, they thinking of a master plan out here. And one thing I got to throw out there too, y'all, and this is most definitely me not trying to make an excuse, but you just got to have a context of this. Like, you got to keep this in the back of your head. She only freaking 18. 18 is basically you still a child. I know that's basically technically when you become an adult or some people consider it 21 or whatever. But regardless, man, at 18, she's still a freaking teenager. You know what I'm saying? So she is a child. So her getting aroused and being manipulated. And I'm not going to even say the dude. I'm not going to even say freaking Clyde really manipulating her. She just liked the shit. She liked doing the, 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 the criminal stuff. But I'm just saying don't forget that she is a child. But she still need to face all her freaking consequences for this. I digress. Let's go. Months, Zi Ying and Rong Ji pulled their scam across China, traveling from city to city, 
renting apartments under different fake names, never staying in one location for too long, and netting between 70,000 and 80,000 yuan from each of their marks, about $10,000 US. It was the perfect crime. Well, except for one little detail. Each of their victims knew what they looked like, and should they ever mm. be asked to pick them out from a police lineup, the jig would be up. True. That needed a change, and so the couple decided to make one little adjustment to their modus operandi. On the 28th of July, 1996, while working at a club called the Philharmonic in Nanchang, Rong Qi enticed one of her customers, a 35-year-old male named Xiong Qi Yi, back to her rented apartment, located down a dark and quiet alleyway. Xi Ying, who was hiding inside, secretly watched as the two entered, and couldn't help but notice the valuable jewellery that Qi Yi was wearing. A gold watch, gold rings, and a gold chain. It was then that Xi Ying attacked Qi Yi. Together, he and Rong Qi removed Qi Yi's clothes and confiscated his valuables. At knife point, Xi Ying demanded to know Qi Yi's address. Figuring it was best to simply comply, Qi Yi told him. Xi Ying thanked him for the information, and then garroted him using a sharp piece of wire. Rong Qi's eyes widened at the sight of Qi Yi struggling for his life. But they didn't widen from fear, but rather from excitement. The couple then set about slicing up the man's remains and packed them into four garbage bags. The duo made two trips to Chi Yi's apartment thereafter, the first to ensure the accuracy of the address, and the second to sever the phone line. That same night, they entered the apartment using the dead man's keys and found his 28-year-old wife, Shang Li, and their three-year-old daughter, Shongling Xuan, asleep. Shi Ying woke them both up and then hogtied them as he searched the apartment for valuables, leaving Rong Qi to guard their prisoners. Disturbingly, Shi Ying further tormented Chang Li and her daughter by showing them the bag containing Qi Yi's head. Shi Ying then Hold the fuck up. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold the hell up, man. Hold up, y'all. Hold the fuck hold hold up. Wait a minute. Let me make some uh sense of it. <laughs> like for real, man. Did I just hear that Clyde and Bunny came into this freaking house that they just killed this freaking man, came into his house with his head in a bag and showed it to his freaking wife and child. Dude, they are at the point of no return. Like the stuff they was doing by blackmailing all uh, the guys and stuff with the whole hostess thing they was doing and stealing the money and all that, breaking and stealing and all that. Um, that was bad. That was bad. But now they have went to a whole late. They have went to it's over nine thousand for all my Dragon Ball fans out there. Like it's over nine thousand where they at. They are at the point of no return. They got the man head in a freaking bag and came to his freaking house and showing it to his wife and freaking child. <laughs> Let's go, man. Strangled Shang Li and her daughter to death using his belt. Giggling with the rush of her first kills, Rong Shi suggested setting the apartment ablaze to destroy any fingerprints they may have left behind. Xi Ying agreed, and in the early hours of July 29th, the couple escaped the burning building with 20,000 yuan, a little less than $3,000 US. Firefighters were summoned to the residence that same night. Inside, they found the smouldering remains of the mother and daughter. The bags containing Chi Yi were found two days later after neighbors reported a foul odor emanating from a community dumpster. On July 29th, the Public Security Bureau of Nanchang initiated an investigation into the Xiong family's deaths. After tracing Chi Yi's steps that fateful night, they realized that he had last been seen at the Philharmonic, leaving with a young hostess named Jin. And Jin hadn't returned to work since. Working backwards, they were able to determine the hostess's true identity, and on August 18th, issued a wanted notice for Lao Rongqi and her unstable boyfriend, Ba Ziying. On October 10th, 1997, after a year of moving through eastern China 
and supporting themselves with their adultery scam, Si Ying and Rong Qi arrived in the city of Wenzhou. There, they targeted 22-year-old Lang Xiaocheng. Rong Qi had befriended Xiaocheng at a KTV club, and upon noticing her Omega wristwatch, presumed her to be rich. That fateful day, they arrived at Xiaocheng's apartment. Mend, after stepping through the door, threatened her with a blade and searched the place for valuables. However, they found little in terms of actual cash. Dissatisfied, they held the knife to Xiaoqian's throat and told her to call someone with a lot of money, or else. She chose to phone her boss, 29-year-old Liu Suqing. Over the phone, Xiaoqian pretended to be ill, and, concerned for her employee, Su Qing rushed over to the apartment. An altruistic decision that would cost her everything. Once Su Qing arrived, Xi Ying tied her up and robbed her, but she too had little cash on her person. And so, while Xi Ying guarded the tied up women, Rong Qi attempted to make withdrawals from both of their bank accounts. One of the tellers, who was familiar with what Su Qing looked like, immediately grew suspicious but Rong Chi assured her that she was just carrying out a favour for a friend. After successfully transferring Su Qing's savings of 25,750 yuan, Xi Ying strangled both hostages without hesitation. He and Rong Chi then fled Wenzhou by coach that same day, taking with them. God damn it, man. I, I knew it was coming, y'all. I knew that they was going to end up killing them too. I was already had been shocked this whole time after finding out that not only did they kill the man, they killed the the uh, the, the, the wife and the, the, the child. And then now they didn't kill. I knew it was coming. I'm like, they, at the end of the day, these people going to end up giving them some money or whatever they can give them. And they still going to kill them. Like I'm telling y'all, they are past the point of no return where it's like they did just cold hearted killers now and they just gonna keep on killing and flee in the scenes this, this is like some buddy and Clyde ish for real for real let's go Them, both women's valuables including their watches purses and phones hours later Xiaochen's phone began ringing Rong Chi answered and unaware who was on the other end of the line told the caller that Xiaoqian was travelling with her boyfriend, that she had mistakenly left her phone behind, and that she wouldn't be back for some time. The caller, named Li, said that that didn't make any sense. He was Xiaoqian's boyfriend. Mm. Li went to Xiaoqian's apartment that next day, and found her door locked. He accessed her balcony through a neighbour's window, and discovered the bodies of his girlfriend and her boss at the entrance, still bound with cable ties. The following week, detectives linked Fa Si Ying to the crime through fingerprints found on the victim's clothing. In September 1998, Rong Ji enticed Liu Hua, an auto shop owner, back to her leased apartment in Changzhou. In a departure from their usual con, Xi Ying immediately attacked Hua as soon as he arrived, stabbing him in the chest. After what the fuck? Nah, they just, they just doing it for the hell of it now, man. It ain't about no money. It ain't about nothing other than they just going to just keep killing. Like, it's the only thing that it, I, I hate to say this, but God damn it, because this just make it make all the sense in the world. And my brothers and sisters, y'all know what I mean when I say it. This right here get bunny pussy wet. This right here is what get her freaking pussy wet, man. Freaking just attacking and killing freaking people. This is what she loved. This is the only thing that get her off. I just had to go and throw it out there, man, because that's what it is. How many more people they going to kill before we get through the end of this video, y'all? We just now a little way halfway through it. We still got a while to go. Jesus, then this this been happening over years. When this video started off, we was way back in 1976 or something like that. This this is good, man. I did not expect this laser, man. Let's go. Subduing and binding Hua, Xi Ying rummaged through his pockets and stole 5,000 yuan and his car keys. He then ordered Hua to phone his wife, instructing her to deliver a ransom. Upon her arrival, Hua's wife was also restrained. Hua desperately begged for his wife's life. Do what you want with me, he cried. But let her live, I beg you. 
Rongji wanted to slay the two regardless, but Xiying was strangely moved by Hua's love for his wife, and he decided to let the pair live. Though mm. not before extorting 70,000 yuan from them and stealing Hua's sports car, leaving them bound in the apartment for their neighbors to discover, terrified but alive. According to them, they look as fuck to be alive. They are seriously lucky, boy, that they spared their life. Si Ying and Rong Chi were remarkably calm and organized during the entire ordeal and communicated mostly through eye contact, as if they could intuitively tell what the other was thinking. On June 21st, 1999, after spending yet another year traversing China, Rong Ji and Zi Ying settled in the eastern city of Hefei. They checked into separate hotels within the same district, and also rented an apartment in Xuanguan, Luyang district, which was to be the setting of their next job. On July 15th, Rong Ji, now working as a bargle in a neon-lit dance hall, encountered Yin Jianhua, a 35-year-old general manager at the Anjida Electronic Company. Jinhua was known for being a generous guy, always buying rounds for other patrons and lending money to friends in need. Again, figuring he must be well off, Rang Ji invited him back to her apartment. Upon stepping through the door though, Si Ying immediately pounced on Jianhua, and after getting the better of him, locked him in a small iron dog cage. Si Ying then gave Jianhua an ultimatum. Write a ransom note to his wife, demanding 300,000 yuan for his safe release, or die. Jianhua, a braver man than most, refused to play ball. He simply didn't believe that Si Ying would follow through with his threat. Yeah. This angered Si Ying, who continued to bark orders at his caged victim, but Jianhua refused to comply. And so, to calm her enraged lover, Rong Chi suggested that they demonstrate just how serious they were. After trying and failing to contact their landlord, Rong Chi instead called up Lu Zhongming, a 33-year-old repairman who lived nearby, and asked him to come to the apartment to fix a broken window. Bro, if they about to kill this man in front of that man that they got locked up in a freaking cage just to get the money out of him, this shit need to be a movie. I'm serious, y'all. Like, I, I, I'm so serious when I say that shit, man. Like, my whole emotion about this whole story has just, like, completely flipped now. As far as, like, I'm, it's good. It's great. It's ex it's excellente all that in a bag of chips but what the hell i'm saying is now i'm starting to listen to how crazy and great and how like one of a kind this story really is man like i have never heard this before like i feel like this some shit that i should have been heard before man like this is a one of a kind type of shit man <laughs> like bro this and maybe it has been a movie before because you know this is an asian type story so maybe over there in china or japan it has been depicted on the tv screen before i don't know man but it's most definitely movie worthy this is just it's like it can't stop getting crazier it's, it's, it'll be one of those type of movies that you watch and the whole movie, it just keep getting... Well, just when you think it's crazy, it just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. I know damn well that it's not about to bring this repair man in this freaking apartment to kill him in front of this man to scare him. Let's see. Upon his arrival, Si Ying attacked Xiongming and dragged him into the bathroom where he struck him. 20 times with an axe. Still trapped in his metal prison, Jianhua could hear Zhongming's screams coming from the other side of the wall. Si Ying then casually walked back into the living room and threw Zhongming's head on the ground in front of the dog cage. There was no need for words. While Rongxi stuffed the repairman into a freezer which he had bought specifically to store bodies, Jianhua wrote a ransom note to his wife instructing her to meet at a specific location with 300,000 yuan. Rongxi casually told him to end the note with the line, I'll be dead for a penny less. Due to a misunderstanding though, the wife missed the initial ransom exchange. As such, a second exchange was set up at the wife's home. Before the handover, Si Ying cut the phone line before entering the apartment, this time wielding a firearm. While Si Ying boasted about his past slings, 
Xianghua's wife managed to secretly contact her manager using a pager and told him to contact law enforcement immediately. While waiting for help to arrive, the wife calmly asked Xi Ying if she could collect the ransom money from some nearby friends. She, of course, actually took the opportunity to escape. The police then surrounded the building, with snipers placed on nearby rooftops to prevent Xi Ying from escaping. A news team just so happened to be following one of the responding units that day, filming an episode of Police Window, a live TV show similar to Cops. They caught the entire standoff on film. While hiding behind a bed, Xi Ying incoherently ranted at the officers outside, debating the value of human life and demanding that they bring him food. At one point, Xi Ying shouted at the cameraman, Hey you there, holding the camera. You don't look like a tough guy. Do you find recording this funny? You might lose your life in a second. After three the hell you mean by that? The hours of negotiation, the authorities opted to pump the apartment full of tear gas. This prompted Xi Ying to open fire. The officers reciprocated. Xi Ying was hit in the right thigh, was subsequently pinned down, and was captured alive at 11 p.m. During his interrogation, he refused to give up the location of his partner in crime, Rong Ji, who was, at that very time, guarding Jianhua. When asked where she was, Xi Ying flat out denied knowing her, buying her plenty of time to cover her tracks and escape the city. On July 27th, investigators were summoned to a residential complex. A landlord had just discovered two bodies inside one of his apartments, both of them stuffed inside a freezer. They were the remains of the caged victim, Jianhua, and the repairman, Zhang Ming. That and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there real quick, y'all. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But I feel like even though Clyde has got locked up, he got caught, but Bunny's still out there. I feel like Bunny's still going to be goddamn out here murdering people, man. Like, I don't think she going to stop. I don't feel like they going to stop until both of them are caught. One arm caught. Let's see what she do. Is she going to keep on doing the same ish they've been doing, or is she just going to try to disappear forever? And then hopefully this freaking uh, AI camera's going to help us figure out where the fuck she was. I don't know, man. This is, man, lazy, man. This shit great. That landlord would later learn that if he had answered the phone on June 21st, he would have been the one summoned to the apartment instead of Zhang Ming. And it would have yeah. been used to demonstrate Xi Ying's willingness to kill. Yeah. As for Jianhua, Rongxi had taken his life after Xi Ying didn't return to the apartment. On a table, written in Rongxi's handwriting, was a note. One which simply read, Honey, I'll wait for you at home. I love you. Still under interrogation, detectives informed Xi Ying that they had found Jianhua's body and that they knew Rongxi was his accomplice. Xi Ying continued to deny knowing any woman named Rongxi and claimed that he had killed Jianhua himself. Strange, as according to experts, Jianhua had perished while Xi Ying was in custody. He then claimed to have tied a rope around Jianhua's neck and attached it to a time mechanism, one which would strangle him after an allotted amount of time had elapsed. That seemed far-fetched, especially since no device was found in the apartment. Finally, Xi Ying said that he had ended Jianhuan's life, quote, whenever the prosecutor says I did. During his trial, Xi Ying tried to use his old Robin Hood defense, saying that he only slayed the rich to give money to the poor. The prosecution rightly pointed out that he had slaughtered a toddler and a working class repairman, and that although his other victims were generous and had prodigal spending habits, none of them were rich. In November 1999, Fa Ying was found guilty of seven counts of murder and was sentenced to death. Less than one month later, on December 28th, he was publicly strapped to a chair and a single shot was fired into the back of his head. He was 35 years old. Can we get a round of applause for that? Can we, can we get a standing ovation for that? Now, I know a lot of y'all probably don't agree with that, but y'all but y'all know who I, how I am about that, man. I feel like if you, especially if you done did all this murdering, man, you need to get murdered your damn self, man. Shot in the head, I don't care how it happened. You need to die too. But 
it um I, I kind of feel like because they did it a month later, like literally a month later, y'all. They was China don't play Japan, wherever the hell they is. They don't freaking play, man. They did it real quick. Now, if if y'all watch Mr. Baller Store from yesterday, we happy that they did. They didn't do it quick because that man was innocent. So I feel like you should give it a lot of time. But if you just look at this case, all the evidence is there that he did it and his freaking uh wife, well, girlfriend. Friend Bunny, she in on it too. We still don't know the freak she yet. He acting like he don't even freaking know her. That's another thing that I want to just speak on is the fact of how much he just protecting her. Like he not giving her up at all to his death. He did not even acknowledge her as a freaking person he ever met in his life. You know what I'm saying, man? So the dude was dedicated to the end, but I'm I'm glad. Long story short, short story long. I'm glad they ended his life because he have ended or have caused a lot of people lives to be ended. Let's go. While one half of the infamous duo had now met his end, the other, Rongji, had somehow managed to disappear without a trace. Despite being one of China's most wanted fugitives, there were no reported sightings of her anywhere. After escaping from Huafei, she eventually made it to a safe house in Chongxing, the home that she mentioned in her farewell note. Mm. It wasn't until January 2000, while watching a news broadcast, that she learned of Zi Ying's execution. Now realizing that her beloved would never return, Rongqi left Chongqing for the city of Xiamen. While on the run, Rangqi stayed in various hostels, hotels and guesthouses, working in pubs, doing odd jobs, and selling her body to support herself. Much of the money she earned was put towards plastic surgery to alter her face and make herself less recognisable. She made use of dozens of fake identities and worked hard to perfect different accents, ultimately becoming a true chameleon. Eventually, her case disappeared from news broadcasts. Her face on billboards and wanted posters were replaced by those of other criminals. Soon, her name faded from everyone's lips. As time passed, she slowly began to let her guard down and started to lead a normal life, believing that she had finally outrun her past. But as she was about to learn, no one can outrun the future. By 2016, Rongxi was working as a barmaid in Xiamen, under the name Sherry. You can see her pictured here at a workplace Christmas party. All of her co-workers agreed that she was a fun and happy worker who made everyone feel at ease. Like she seriously tried to outrun her past and she thought she had outran her past. You know what I'm saying? But one thing that the lazy man just said, boy, that was some of the realest shit I probably heard in my freaking life. You cannot outrun the future. Like you would never be able to outrun the future because you running, but the future is always going to be in head because it's the freaking future. That was some real shit, man. But yeah, she had got real comfortable, y'all, thinking that she just going to go back to this regular life after you. I mean, bro, I'm just saying, man, anybody dying, anybody being murdered is one thing. You killing any just one person. But y'all did this shit over years destroying so many people lives like children like dudes you have done so freaking much and now you want to go back and live normal nah it don't work like that ain't it can't work like that in 2017 she moved on to a car dealership where she worked as a saleswoman it was during this period that she entered into a new relationship with a man that she met at work little did her new partner and friends realize that her entire identity was merely a persona. In 2019, the PRC celebrated its 70th birthday. To mark the occasion, the government decided it wanted to spruce up the nation's image, and that included apprehending wanted fugitives. Thus, they launched Operation Cloud Sword, an initiative that would use new technology to bring criminals to justice. This included installing hundreds of millions of AI-powered cameras with face recognition capabilities throughout the Middle Kingdom, creating the largest and most sophisticated surveillance network in the world. 
These cameras can identify any of the nation's 1.4 billion residents in just three seconds. For Chinese citizens though, Operation Cloud Sword could well be renamed Operation Double-Edged Sword. On the one hand, this new technology will, inevitably, give Big Brother more control over their everyday lives. But on the other, it does mean that felons are far less likely to get away with their actions. And no case better yeah. exemplifies that than Rong Qi's. On November 27th, 2019, the cameras monitoring the Dongbei Kaitang Plaza in Xiamen came up with an unexpected match. One of the workers at the mall, a friendly, flirty and popular watch vendor, bore a strong resemblance to Lao Rongqi, the fugitive who had evaded capture for 23 years. To the human eye, there was perhaps a slight resemblance, but the cameras consistently reported a 97.33% match. That picture right there, that shit, yeah, that looked like you. I know you tried to change your face a little bit, but that looked like your ass. You know what I'm saying? Yes, man. It's man, see? That what I'm saying, y'all. I, and I, like I said too, I be talking bad about AI because I feel like it's going to change history in a bad way. But you, you look at it on the other side, it also can help change history in a good way. It can help change these freaking history points where we don't know where some. Uh, uh, who uh we don't know the murderer where they at but now we could find out where they at with the use of ai you know what i'm saying and they can just alternate history because now we got it's not a cold case the case is solved you know what i'm saying so uh it go both ways but yes man yes that is you officers in plain clothes arrived at the mall the following day and asked the shopkeeper to come in for questioning the woman claimed her name was Hong Ye Zhao and said that there must be some sort of mistake. Still, just to put their minds at ease, they escorted her back to the station. There, a DNA test confirmed that Hong Ye Zhao was undoubtedly the woman that they had been hunting for two decades, Lao Longqi. Having effectively hidden from the law for so long, Longqi had stopped worrying about being seen in public, even by surveillance cameras. She had heard about the new AI cameras being installed everywhere, but underestimated just how advanced they were. And so, when her boyfriend offered her a part-time job at his watch stall, she eagerly accepted. That same boyfriend stood by her side during the lead-up to her trial, and pledged to spend all of his money on her defence, believing that they really did have the wrong woman. But he needn't have bothered. In the face of the DNA evidence, Rongxi confessed to being the maid Marion to Zi Ying's Robin Hood or, more aptly, the Bonnie to his Clyde. But she insisted that she had been an unwilling participant in this rampage, and placed the entire blame on her long-dead former boyfriend. In her words, That's fucked up. That's fucked up. Because you remember, uh, Clyde, Clyde never gave her up. He never s s snitched on her, never said nothing about her, act like he didn't know her. But now she want to try to place the blame all on him. You know what I'm saying, man? When it was making her pussy wet when they was doing the shit. But now you want to place the blame. Oh, he made me do it. It's all on him. Now, man, you should be, be real with it. Be real. And another thing, my brothers and sisters, her current partner, you know what I'm saying? He trying to defend her at his strongest the, the much as he could gonna spend all the money he can to defend her because he don't believe it's her but the thing is bro dna don't lie it don't lie si ying had forced her to be his accomplice and threatened to slay her family if she didn't help him if anything she was the real victim she had thought about escaping of course but didn't know where to go or who to ask for help i didn't want to kill anyone she told the court through floods of tears. I just wanted to live. Believe me, my screams were often louder than the victims. But a plethora of evidence, including phone records, CCTV footage, eyewitness testimonies, timeline discrepancies, contradictory statements and forensics, told a different story. That Rongqi was not only complicit in the slayings, but was, in all likelihood, a willing participant. That yes, she was she the was. one who had selected their marks. That she had egged Zi Ying on to commit more and more heinous acts. That she had killed Jianhua with her own hands, purely out of malice. And that she did all this, not because she was forced to, but because of hybristrophilia. 
Forensic psychologist Catherine Ramsland compiled a list of motives explaining why some women date and even marry serial killers. According to her, some believe they can change a criminal and make him a good person. Well, Rongxi never tried to do that. She actively encouraged Zi Ying's nefarious ways. Some hoped to gain public attention and become infamous. Rongxi had spent 23 years trying to escape the law, so it wasn't that either. Yep. Some are apparently unable to find love in normal ways. Before meeting Zi Ying, Rongxi was living a completely normal life and could have easily found a well-adjusted partner. So again, no dice. I said that way earlier, man. Look at her, man. She was a beautiful woman. She could have got a, a regular dude that's not freaking crazy as fuck. But she chose the, the, the crazy motherfucker because she was crazy her damn self. And some desire to live out a fantasy in which they're dating the perfect boyfriend. That sounds more like it. Psychologists for the prosecution argued that Rongji had fallen for a man she considered an alpha male, even though she knew he was a morally reprehensible person, and she was only crying because it was finally time to answer for her past actions. In response, all Rongji could do was apologize to the families of her victims, including Zhu Dahong, the widow of repairman Shong Ming. Zhu Dahong was left to single-handedly raise their three children and provide for five other family members, including Xiong Ming's mother, who, overwhelmed by grief, had reportedly cried so much that she went blind. Rongqi also apologized to her own boyfriend, not only for lying to him, but for allowing him to spend all of his money on her legal defense. Though she didn't have any money to compensate the people that she had wronged, she offered to start a GoFundMe in their names. That should make them all square, right? Not quite, Rongji. On September 9th, 2021, the court found Lao Rongji guilty of serial homicide. She was given the same sentence as her former accomplice, Si Ying. The Supreme People's Court upheld her sentence after an appeal on August 18th, 2022. Following that, Rongji was allowed to see her family one last time before her demise. The family she hadn't spoken to in 23 years. Wow. Trembling, she apologized for everything that she had done, asked them to pay back the 200 yuan that she owed her boyfriend's mother, and prayed that no future members of the Lao family ever ended up like her. On Monday, December 18th, 2023, Rongqi's life was ended via lethal injection. She was 49 years old. And so ended one of the most chilling partnerships in modern history. That of China's Bonnie and Clyde. So, was there some truth in Rongqi's defense that Si Ying had threatened and coerced her? Maybe some. He was an extremely cold hearted guy after all. But she was an adult, capable of making her own choices. And she not only chose to avoid contacting the authorities, but also chose to evade them for decades. I'd also wager that Si Ying did care about Rongqi. After all, he never once turned her over to save his own skin. But I'd love to hear what you think about this case. Was Rongqi telling the truth? And even if she was, should she have received a lesser punishment given her actions? Also, what do you think about the AI surveillance? Is it a mass invasion of privacy? Or are you willing to be catalogued if it makes society safer? I'm sure that's a question most of our countries will be grappling with in due course. But with AI cameras, familial DNA advancements, and other new investigative methods. In our brave new future, the perfect crime is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Oh my God, my brothers and sisters, man, listen, y'all. I'm so overcome with emotions right now, man, because I feel like, dude, this is at least top three Lazy Man videos we have ever watched. And that is saying a mouthful, man, because we have, shit, man, Lazy Man always delivers. That is saying a lot, but this one right here, dude, I'm just like, how the, f I never heard about this crazy-ish, man. And, ugh. At the end of the day, both of these crazy maniac mother is dead now. 
You know what I'm saying, man? And it and, and like I said, some of y'all might not agree with the whole death penalty thing, but for me, that is very freaking satisfying, man. Even her, after all those years, 23 years, she had got back so comfortable. So she thinking that she can just work at a place and, and, and nobody gonna know who she is. You know what I'm saying, man? And they still caught her. Like that just feels so freaking good and so freaking refreshing, man. Thank you, man. Like, thank God. You know what I'm saying, y'all? And just the way the lazy man just told his whole story, bro. I'm just listening at this shit. I'm like, man, this is like, I'm literally listening to a movie, man. That's why I be saying, my brothers and sisters, get whatever you may need. Because we about to be, hey, eating popcorn and watching cinema around this mother. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, that was so great from the lazy man, y'all. Like, the way he laid it out, all the details. Sales. oh my god and they like literally are freaking bunny and clyde like that was a bunny and clyde store that was just freaking crazy i know i keep saying crazy but that's just it the shit was crazy my brothers and sisters um uh her um trying to how she just was so quick to just say make it sound like she was just the victim in this whole story was so crazy but it's also you can freaking oh it's a lot of evidence there to debunk that whole thing man and just the amount of freaking people they murdered in this time frame over these years you know what i'm saying it's like wow dude wow my brothers and sisters i did not expect this going into this video like i expected to be great just because it's the lazy man anyway but man this was like breathtaking for me like this shit <laughs> y'all some of y'all may say man i'm exaggerating i'm capping i'm using hyperbole but man this was freaking oscar performance worthy by the lazy man telling this story y'all great freaking video but i digress I'm gonna go let y'all go now, man. Y'all just please, 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 please make sure that y'all hit that like button. Y'all comment, subscribe, do all that. And come on back tomorrow for another That Chapter Wednesday. But until then, my friends, also remember this. Lord, peace and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.